Hi dear students, I am Kavita. I will be teaching anthropology optional for Sri Ram IAS on an academy platform. In anthropology paper 1, in unit number 6, we have the culture theories. In this chapter, we will be discussing a lot of culture theories like evolutionism, diffusionism, functionalism, structural functionalism and so on. Among those theories, one important and very interesting theory is the culture and personality. So, whenever you get a question from this topic, that is the culture theories topic, please make sure you attend the question because you will be able to score exceptionally good marks when you take up questions from culture theory chapter. These theories might sound a little bit boring, but if you understand and frame your answers well, you can definitely score very good score in anthropology by attempting questions on this topic. So let's begin. Culture and personality. First of all, what is culture? Culture, according to E.B. Tyler, is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, moral, law, customs and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a man as a member of the society. So take for example the Indian society. We being Indians, we have a lot of knowledge about our Indian art and culture, about sculptures and so on, about the belief, arts, morals, customs, we celebrate our national festivals, we have our dressing pattern, our food habits and so on. So being members of this society, that is Indian society, we have adapted the Indian culture, isn't it? That is what E.B. Tyler, e. Tyler defines culture as the complex whole, that is the total of all these, that is the complete whole of knowledge, belief, art, moral, law, customs and other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of the society. What do we mean by personality? Personality is the totality of values, interest, motivation, physiology, morphology, aptitude, temperament, etc. So we usually often say that this person's personality is good. This person has a great personality. He has a charismatic personality, isn't it? So what do we mean exactly by the personality? So it is the total or the whole of what, what interests we have, what motivates us, what kind of values and morals we possess, what is the temperament we have, our attitude towards various things. This in totality is what we mean by personality. So there are various factors which influence the formation of personality in an individual, isn't it? So few of them are environment, heredity, culture and peculiar experiences. So what do we mean by environment? It is inclusive of the geographical location where we live. Say you can see being a society or being a person belonging to Indian society you will have certain cultural traits. Whereas a person born and raised in Australia or some European country or in uh, USA, they might possess certain cultural traits which help in formation of their personality. So the environment in which we are born and raised contributes to the formation of the personality in us. Similarly, heredity. So the genes which we acquire from our parents not just decides our stature, color complexion, hair color, hair uh, texture and so on. It also affects our personality in both positive as well as negative ways. Say for example, a guy who has acquired genes for tallness and uh, you know an athletic build up from his parents will be very confident. He will have a confident personality, isn't it? And culture. So the culture that is the habits, the customs, the law, practices in which we are raised also definitely contributes to our culture, definitely contributes to our 
पर्सनैलिटी एस इट इट यू मस्ट हैव नोटिस दैट मेनी टाइम्स स्पोर्ट्स पीपल्स और स्पोर्ट्स पर्सन और एथलेटिक्स चिल्ड्रेन विल मोस्टली इंटरेस्टेड इन दैट पर्टिकुलर फील्ड सेम इज द केस विद म्यूजिशियंस और एनी अदर फील्ड यू कैन फाइंड दैट बिकॉज ऑफ दैट एनवायरमेंट इन विच दे आर रेज इन दैट कल्चरल सेटअप इन विच दे आर बींग रेज दे विल हैव सिमिलर इंटरेस्ट विच डिफाइन देयर पर्सनैलिटी then finally peculiar experiences man is a person made of experiences isn't it every single experience right from our childhood up to now be it positive or negative definitely influences in building up personality so it also has an important contribution in formation of an individual's personality so now that we know what we mean by culture and what we mean by personality we shall discuss further about the theory culture and personality during the 1920s some students of franz boas and alfred kroeber were critical of the earlier theories like evolutionism diffusionism structural functionalism and so on they felt that these theories did not totally help them in understanding how culture influenced the members of a society they believe that it is very essential to do psychoanalytic study of the members of the society in order to understand the culture of that society hence they came up with a new school of thought which is called as the culture and personality approach or it is also called as the anthropopsychological approach because here we are using psychoanalysis to understand the interrelationship between culture and personality so the members belonging to this culture and personality school of thought are ruth fulton benedict margaret mead rolf linton cora du bois and abram cardiner so what does this school advocate the culture and personality approach or the anthropopsychological approach the primary aim of this school of thought is to examine the interrelationships between culture and personality okay so this school of thought entirely deals with understanding the interrelationship between the culture and the personality of the members belonging to a particular society so now these members belonging to this school of thought had two important questions in mind the first one was why was there a similarity in the personality or the character traits of members belonging to a particular group and the second question was why does the personality type of one group differ from the personality type of another group so these two important questions they they wanted to understand and finally they came up with the conclusion that culture plays a significant role in the personality formation of the members belonging to a particular group okay so you can see that there is a similarity in the personality or the character traits of members belonging to a particular group let's take the example of our indian society we all love cricket isn't it so that is one of the basic personality trait which you can find throughout the country whereas at the same time you can find certain differences in the personality type of members belonging to different communities or different societies so you take for example the personality traits of members belonging to delhi and the personality traits of members belonging to mumbai you can find that there are certain differences even though we all come under the indian society uh, in uh, in the local population if you see you can find there is variation among the cultural traits so they said that the culture plays a significant role in the development of traits cultural traits and personality among the members belonging to a particular society so in the culture and personality school of thought we have three sub schools the first one is the sub school which was advocated by margaret mead which says that culture determines the formation of personality that is here margaret mead says it is the culture of the society in which we are present 
which influences the personality of the individuals belonging to that society. So, this sub-school of thought was advocated by Margaret Mead. The second sub-school says that it is the personality of the individuals belonging to a particular society which builds the culture of that society. Correct? So, that is, it is opposite to what Margaret Mead says. That is, Margaret Mead advocated that culture influences the personality of the members, whereas in the second sub-school, they say that it is the personality of the individual members belonging to that society which forms or builds the culture of that society. So, this second school of thought was advocated by Ruth Benedict. And the third sub-school which says that it is both culture which influences the personality and vice versa. That is, they say that the culture of the society influences the personality of the members in that society and on the other hand, the personality of the members in that society influences the culture of that society. So, they say both of them go hand in hand. So, this school of thought was advocated by Rolf Linton, Abraham Cardiner and Cora Du Bois. So, in our syllabus, we discuss in detail about the contributions of each one of these anthropologists and each one of these sub-schools. However, if uh, it is a lengthy topic and for this lecture, we will be concentrating only on the contributions of Rolf Linton and about the contributions of the other anthropologists, we shall be discussing in our further lectures. Now, let us begin with Rolf Linton. Rolf Linton is a very important uh, topic in uh, anthropology and many times you can get questions from this topic. So, it is a very important topic. Rolf Linton. Rolf Linton was basically an archaeologist and then during 1920 to 22, he was sent to Marquesa Islands. There actually he got influenced by the culture of the Marquesa Islanders and he wrote a book and it is by, you know, when he went to the Marquesa Island, he got influenced by the culture of the Marquesa Islanders and he shifted his focus from archaeology towards cultural anthropology. Two of his famous books are The Study of Man and The Cultural Background of Personality. So, later after this, there was an interdisciplinary seminar which was held in Columbia University during the 1920s. In this interdisciplinary seminar, there were scholars from anthropology, psychology and sociology who came together and they discussed about culture and the interrelationship between culture and personality. It is there that Rolf Linton got interested in this concept and this interdisciplinary seminar was also attended by Cora Du Bois and Abraham Cardiner as well. So, during this seminar, they discussed the need for an interdisciplinary approach to understand the role of culture in personality and vice versa. That is, during this seminar, when scholars from anthropology, psychology and sociology came together, they understood that there is a need for cooperation of all these three subjects in order to decipher and understand in a proper way the relationship between culture and personality. See, sociology studies society, anthropology studies man and psychology studies individuals. So, all these three subjects need to cooperate and come together if we need to understand the interrelationship between culture and personality. And they say that both culture and personality are interdependent and interrelated in the whole of the same phenomenon. So, the second important book of Rolf Linton is The Cultural Background of Personality. In this book, Rolf Linton discusses about the cultural background of personality wherein he defines culture, he classifies culture on the basis of behavior and he also defines personality and he shows, he tries to explain how personality is formed in a given cultural situation. 
So these two are very important books in uh, of uh, Rolf Linton and mentioning these books in the answer will definitely fetch you better marks. So according to Rolf Linton, culture may be defined as the sum total of knowledge, attitudes and normal behavior pattern shared and transmitted by the members of a particular society. Okay. So Rolf Linton says that culture is the sum total of the knowledge, attitudes and normal behavior pattern shared and transmitted by the members of a particular society. So this definition is also closely similar to that of E.B. Tyler but here he includes another word say shared and transmitted by the members of a particular society. So it is not just the knowledge, uh, attitudes and normal behavior patterns which we acquire as being members of a particular society we also transmit it to our future generations. This is what he defines as culture. Ralph Linton divides culture into three groups. The first one is real culture which is also called as the actual behavior. And second one is the ideal culture which is the philosophical and the traditional culture. And the third one is culture construct which means what is written about culture. So let me give you an example. Take for example monogamy. In a religious myth Ramayana, Rama is a, a person who is um, praised for being, you know, having a single wife, right? So according to a philosophical and traditional culture, monogamy is a practice and it is an ideal culture. However, in reality, does that happen? There are few people who marry only once, whereas there are people who have multiple marriages as well. So, that is the actual behavior. Whereas, after reading about this, after understanding and reading about a particular culture, what I interpret and what I write about it, that is called as the culture construct. I hope you got a clear picture of this. What do we mean by real culture, ideal culture and culture construct? I will repeat once again. So, an ideal culture is the culture which has been mentioned in the religious texts or which has a philosophical or traditional cultural roots. That is called as the ideal culture which we look up to, which we say this is the ideal thing to do, right? Whereas, the reality may not be similar or same as that of the real ideal culture, isn't it? The reality will be different. So that is called as the real culture. And when I study a culture and what I understand from that culture and I interpret in my own words, that is called as the culture construct. Prof. Linton distinguishes between the culture universals, cultural alternative and culture specialist. What do you mean by cultural universal? So there are certain cultural traits or practices or habits which are universal throughout all cultures, isn't it? Irrespective of whether it is a very tiny society in some island in the Pacific Ocean or it is in a huge country, irrespective of that, certain habits or practices or morals or values, any aspect or any cultural trait is uniform that is it is present among all the cultures that is called as the cultural universal. Let me give you an example say killing another person that is a cultural universal and it is not acceptable among any cultures isn't it killing a, another fellow human being is a crime right. So it is not acceptable across any culture in any part of the world so that is a cultural universal. Next comes culture alternative. So when we say cultural alternatives, let me give you the example of uh, say you are traveling from a point A to your destination which is point B. So you have multiple options to travel. Say you can take a bicycle or you can drive a scooter or you can take a local uh, train or you can go through metro train or you can take a car. So there are multiple options for you to move from point A to point B, right? 
So, in a culture, there are various alternatives, isn't it? So, this is called as cultural alternative. Next comes cultural specialist. What do we mean by cultural specialist? Certain roles, certain function, certain statuses in any culture are given only to few members of the society and not to all the members of the society. This is what we call as cultural specialist. Okay. So, certain role or function or statuses are given only to few particular members of that society and it is not given to all the members of the society. This is called cultural specialist. So, let me give you an example. Say, nursing a baby. Across all cultures, irrespective of which part of the world you are, nursing a baby is the activity or the function of the mother. Isn't it? It is the function of the female or the mother or the woman. So, that is a cultural special speciality. It is not, it is not carried out by the male or the men. Right? So, this particular function or role is designated only to the female group. So, this is what we, we can call as cultural specialist. Then, uh, Ross Linton also speaks about various cultural patterns like the general cultural pattern, subcultural pattern, contracultural pattern. General cultural pattern. Say, we have a, let us take the example of food habits. So, morning when we wake up, depending on which part of the country you belong to, you will have breakfast. So, if you are in North India, you will have mostly poha or uh, um, um, what else? <laughs> you will have either, you know, paratas, rotis and all these are the popular breakfast options in North India. Whereas, if you are in South India, you will have idli, dosa, upma and all these things. Then after breakfast, say around 11 or so, you will take a chai or tea or coffee or something. And then for lunch, you will have an elaborate meal, right? And then followed by some snacks in the evening and then followed by a uh, dinner. So, this is a proper pattern which we follow, right? So, we have breakfast and then followed by a small tea break and then lunch and then snacks and then finally in the night we have dinner. So, this is a general cultural pattern which you can witness throughout wherever you are. Whereas, there are subcultural patterns that is even though this is the common general pattern which we follow throughout the country, in different parts of the country, what food you consume varies, right? So, as I already told you, if you are in North India, you will have breakfast of paratha or poha. If you are in South India, you will have some uh, idli dosa, right? Similarly, for lunch, uh, if you are in the North, mostly what is preferred is roti, sabzi, dal and all that. Whereas, in South India, you can find people having rice, ragi ball and all this. So, even though the overall pattern that is breakfast, lunch, that is the uh, overall pattern that is how you are going to have food throughout the day is the same. Individually, the, you know, at different regions, there is variations, isn't it? Depending on which part of the country you belong to and again further based on which uh, society you belong to, what your food habits are, it varies. This is called as subcultural pattern. Then comes Contra-cultural pattern. So, I told you what is the common breakfast options that are available for uh, in North India and what is available in South India. Can you uh, see any anyone saying, early morning I will wake up and I will have a one full biryani. That is not a possibility, right? But there are some people who will not just break the cultural pattern, but also question the existing cultural pattern. See, wherever which part of the country you belong to, uh, biryani is not something which is, use, which is usually had for breakfast. Probably you can have it for lunch or even for dinner. But there are some people who will challenge the existing pattern and they will break the existing pattern. And this is called as contra-cultural pattern. Right? So, I hope you got a good picture based on the examples which I gave. That is, what is a general cultural pattern? What is a subcultural pattern and what is a contra-cultural pattern? That is challenging the general cultural pattern which already exists, right? That is called as contra-cultural pattern. So, what does Rolf Linton speak about personality? According to Rolf Linton, 
personality is an organized aggregate of psychological processes and state pertaining to the individual. So he says it is an organized aggregate of psychological processes and state pertaining to a particular individual. So he says that it is the aggregate of the habits which have been established in the individual which constitutes the bulk of the personality and give it form, structure and continuity. So he says that man is a person of habits, right? So what habits we have? So our everyday habits determine our personality, right? From what time we wake up, what we eat, whether we are punctual to school or college, how we interact with others, what kind of values we have, all of these, even the tiniest habits, right? Whether we copy in the exam, right? That is also one of the values. So every single habit of ours, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, that determines our personality. This is what Ross Linton says. He says that the in individual, the organized aggregates of habits have been established in the individual. They constitute the bulk of the personality and it gives him the structure and the continuity to go ahead. So, Rolf Linton also defines personality in relation to the habits and he tries to explain it from the functional point of view. So, Rolf Linton links what is personality and how it is helping us in our life. That is what is the functional role of the personality. Got it? So, Rolf Linton tries to explain the role of personality in our lives. He says that culture is the product of need, right? So, the cultural habits which we have are made in order to satisfy various needs of human beings, isn't it? So, you can take say for example, hunger, right? Hunger is a biological need and in order to satisfy that, we have food. Food is a cultural uh, trait, isn't it? Then we feel cold. So, that is a biological need. Feeling cold is a biological need. And in order to protect ourselves from the cold and to keep ourselves warm, we wear clothes. Correct? So, that is a response to the biological need, which is a cultural trait. Isn't it? So, Rolf Linton says that culture, whatever we have, is based on the needs which we have. So, in response to whatever needs we have, our culture is developed. This is what basically Rolf Linton is trying to say. He says that the satisfaction of the needs maintains the survival of man and culture. That is, we try to satisfy the needs which we have and that leads to the development or the uh, cultural response according to the needs which we have. So, Rolf Linton speaks about two types of needs. First one is the biological or the physiological need. And second one is the psychic need. So, biological or physi uh, physiological need. As I already told you, hunger is a biological need. Sorry, hunger is a biological uh, need for which the cultural response is consumption of food. Right? Feeling cold or warm is a biological need. Again, we wear clothes to keep ourselves warm. That is a cultural trait. Similarly, we construct a house to protect us from the uh, heat or cold or rain or storm. That is again a cultural aspect, isn't it? So, we have various biological or physiological needs which are satisfied by the cultural or cultural elements. Similarly, we have psychic needs as well. Say, let me give you an example. So, when a child is hungry, the mother will feed the child, isn't it? She will nurse the baby. So, the child is hungry and it is crying and the mother will nurse it. So, the hunger of the baby is the biological need and the mother is nursing it. So, just with that, the child will not become happy. In addition to that, the mother also has to give some love, affection, care and you know, a lot of love for the baby so that overall development of the baby into an adult will be in a proper way. If not, if only the biological needs of the baby is satisfied and he does not get any love and affection from his mother or parents or other people, he will most probably develop into an abnormal child. We cannot say abnormal, but a child with uh, not, you know, not a very good personality, 
with inferiority and many other issues, isn't it? So, he says that there are two types of needs and in addition to satisfaction of the biological or the physiological needs, the psychic needs are also very, very essential and these also need to be fulfilled. Got it? Not just the satisfaction of the biological needs, but also satisfaction of the psychic needs is also essential. This is what Rolf Linton says. So, uh, Rolf Linton gives three responses for the um, for the various needs in the society. The way there are various needs. Say a person in the society has to satisfy the needs of so many people, right? So, he has to satisfy the needs of his wife, children, his family, parents and his friends, his community, the society in which he is living, all of these. So, how does he respond to the various needs of the society? So, a man responds to various needs of the society in three ways. First one is the emotional response, right? So, he shares his emotions with his spouse, children, parents, friends, all of this. So, this is one way why, through which he responds to the needs. Second one is the security for long term. So, in addition to this, human beings are social animals. They cannot live in isolation, isn't it? It's very difficult for human beings to live in isolation. So, that is why we enter into relationships, right? Be it marriage, friendship, having children and growing the family lineage. What are all of this for? In addition to continuing the family lineage, it is also essential to have all these relationships for our emotional needs and also for a long-term security. So, we have that feeling that, okay, we have a family who will take care of us, right? So, this is one of the emotional response. This is one of the three responses which Rolf Rinton speaks about. First one is the emotional response. Second one is the security for long-term relationships. And third one is novelty of experience. So, human being is not someone who just who is born, who does his basic activities in life and then dies one day. He craves for a lot of new adventures and experiences in life, isn't it? After all, it is the experiences which gives us a lot of insights about many things. So, as part of, nobody likes to just carry on with their daily mundane activities and end their life, right? So, they crave for a lot of new experiences and that is why he takes up activities like be it uh, starting a new business or start doing some adventurous activities, going on trips or whatever, right? So, novelty of experience is also one way through which he responds to the needs of the society. I hope you got a good understanding of the three responses given by Rod Linton. Then, Rolf Linton says that in order to satisfy the variety of needs in the society, an individual makes responses in simultaneous ways, right? So, in order to satisfy the various needs of the society, he makes responses in simultaneous ways and this he terms as simultaneous response principle, right? So, in order to satisfy the needs of the society, in the society there is not a single need. So, there is a different need from your family, from friends, from children, from parents and everything. So, to satisfy all of this, he makes simultaneous responses and this he terms as simultaneous response principle. Then he says that their responses can be in three ways. That is how he responds to the needs of the society. It can be in three ways. First one is by imitation. So, probably a person is facing a situation and he has to respond to that. So, what will he do? He will do something which he has already observed earlier. Suppose in that situation, what somebody else, maybe his friend or family member or somebody else, in that situation, how they responded to that situation, he will also do the same thing. Got it? Then, second one is by trial and error. So, some people, they do not prefer copying others' methods. They want to try their own. So, in response to the needs of the society, they will try some methods which they think might work. If that doesn't work, then second time they will try something new. Right? So, like this, by trial and error, doing it again and again, 
they will try to understand which response actually works in the situation. So this is one of the response. And the third one is the intellectual method. That is, he does a lot of brainstorming, applies his mind. Neither he wants to copy somebody else's method, nor does he want to try and figure out what works. Instead, he will use his mind, brain, make mind maps and everything, right? Brainstorming and everything. And then finally, he tries, you know, that method. He assumes or he comes to a conclusion that this is the method or this is the response which is apt for this particular situation and he executes that. This is called as the intellectual method. And Rolf Langton, along with Abraham Cardinal, also gave the concept of the basic personality. That is, by basic personality, we mean that in a particular society, even though there are variations among individuals, overall, they have a personality that is called as a basic personality, which can be found among all the members belonging to that society. This is called as the basic personality construct. And this uh, basic personality construct was developed by Rolf Linton along with Abraham Cardinal. We shall be discussing more about basic personality construct in our future lectures. As of now, I hope you got a clear understanding of the contributions of Rolf Linton to the culture and personality school of thought. Hope to see you soon in our future lectures. Until then, take care. Bye. Have a good day.